G'day, g'day. Welcome back, Sports Medicine fans, to episode 78 of the Sports Medicine Project. Of course, another good episode. We hope it's another good episode coming to you this week. It's a very timely episode. Well, it has been for us, and it kind of sparked our, I guess, our motivation to really try and put pen to paper and I guess typing to words on how to think about managing the injured runner leading into a, mm. a marathon or a half marathon and yeah, yeah. what sparked this motivation was a few and seems to be ever growing runners coming into the clinic with events coming up in the near future. Yeah, next couple of weeks, couple of months and yeah, they've got pain, injury, but they still want to train and so they should and we know they should, but how can we help them get through their training and into the event. But before we get to that, that was a very long intro, but welcome to my co-host, Kelly. How you doing, Kelly? I'm good. I'm excited for this episode. I reckon this will be a fun one to just flesh out, you know, Mm -hmm. get really right into the nuts and bolts of how do you get into an event or how do you get through an event Mm -hmm. or decision-making as to if you should do the event when you have an injury. Yeah. Now, we, like this podcast and our socials is certainly tailored towards the clinician however a lot of the information is transferable between patient general public Mm. or a clinician so i guess the way that we're posturing it is we are the clinician or you you listening are the clinician and you're seeing someone in the clinic who and we're using running as an example because that's probably what most commonly comes into the clinic as an, uh, an endurance sport but what can you and do? what we're be- best at. Like, that's what we yeah. would see the most of. Yeah. So someone has pain or an injury and they have an event coming up in the future. What considerations, or I guess, what's the framework and, yeah, the considerations for your clinical decision-making and also with the person in front of you mm. and how can they get into that event? Because it's tricky and lots of things come into it as we're, we're mm. going to delve into. And if you're a runner listening to this, I would probably recommend going and seeing a clinician at least just to get to the bottom of what the injury is that you're dealing with. Mm. There's some nasty injuries that can happen when you have a high training load and we want to be ruling that out before making decisions around whether a race is a good idea or not. Yes, yeah. Now, before we get in to Before that, we get into that... Mm, I'm going to turn this mic down and be screaming in these ears. <laughs> We better address the elephant in the room. Wait, before we get into that, let's say because it's at the start, if you are listening to this, and I know there's been a couple of you that signed up during the week, our Patreon is up and running, which will be every single week, Kelly and I will go through a a real case study with a couple of of things changed and yeah, just talk through our clinical justification presentations, what clinical tests we did, what questions did we ask, what were the likely outcomes, what rehab, how did we do the orthotic, how did we do the taping, how did we do the footwear, all those kinds of things which are really important and yeah, just get some different differing opinions, I guess. And yeah, this week's gonna be a good one. And it's not that common, we were just saying this morning that, you know, you've never seen a compartment syndrome, but I tend to see it quite a lot. So yeah, this week we're talking about stress fractures and compartment syndrome, them together and also in singularity, the testing we use and the likely outcome for them and also the return to running as well, which is bloody interesting, which is, it's not very common, but it's it's pretty cool. Mm. I, I found it quite interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, what did you... The elephant about, in the room. Which is... Yeah. I've been booted from social media. Well... <laughs> <laughs> You haven't been booted because you were never actually really on there. <laughs> I know. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah. So Blake you... does Blake does 99.9% of the social media posts on the Sports Medicine Project. Mm. So together we made the decision that that was going to become his clinical social media post yeah. because I shouldn't really be taking the, the credit for all the hard work <laughs> that he's doing. Um, I quite like the podcasting side of things, so I'll, yeah. I'll continue to be here for the, the conversations, but Blake will be the, the full face behind the page of Blake Withers Pod. Is that, yeah, that what Blake it's called Withers now? Yeah, dot, dot Pod. I think that one of the main reasons was, you know, it was just, 
I would get frustrated because we would talk about you doing a post or you creating content or just discussing mm. your opinion and you would just never do it. Yeah, so now I'm off the hook. Now so now I have never have so to then, do it. Yeah. So now there's just less stress because I'm like, if it's not done, it's on me. And, and I don't I'm have to this. walk around with that guilt that I've never done a post. Yeah, that's true. There was this one time where you, uh, it was... Remember, I had come up with the idea of every Tuesday we're going to do a female-focused mm. post, whether it be about Red S or bone stress injuries, and there were probably maybe three or four weeks we did it every Tuesday, and it was it was awesome. But now that's just yeah, yeah it fizzled. Off. Yeah, that Sorry. fizzled pretty quick. I will I will occasionally throw the odd post. You might on have there. a guest appearance and come back on. I'll have a few guest appearances and come back on. Yeah, but it can't be a post that you've already done somewhere else. Ah. Uh then I probably won't ever do anything. <laughs> it's, it's only the recycled ones from Newcastle Performance Physio. Yeah, I never another one. <laughs> Work smarter, not harder. Yeah, that's true. So what considerations are there? Now we're going to go into each subcategory quite extensively, I think, as we probably do. And I think there's going to be some differing different opinions. But the, the general framework and this is how we're I guess how we posture it to people as well it fits into the seriousness the, sorry the seriousness of the condition irritability and the pain the goal of the race the race characteristics the psychology and the archetype of the person impact or any future events time until the race and then also what offloading tools can we utilize both internal and external? So as an example, internal might be cadence and external might be orthotics and shoes. Now, within those categories, there's lots of subcategories which we're gonna talk about, but I think we we nailed that yep. pretty well. There's obviously different ways to talk about it. And as a clinician, you think of things, mm. I guess you you do prioritize what you think is most important. Like for me right now, I mean, I put it at the top, the seriousness of a condition for me seems to be the most important. I think that is the most important. <clears throat> mm. yeah, yeah, you'd agree? Yeah. Yeah, well, let's, let's talk about that. So I thought we might start off with an example with each to make it... Yeah, I think before that, mm. we're going to also divide it into things to be thinking out, thinking about before the event has actually happened then things to think about during the event and then after the event as well. So most of your decision making will be before the event. And yes. that's where we that's where we'll talk about, you know, some injury characteristics, for example, the seriousness of the injury. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the the scenario is and I, I don't know if this differs for you, but the scenario has certainly been for me someone comes into the clinic and it's generally before a race where they're increasing their, whether it be their elevation, their volume, their intensity, their frequency. These are when injuries are perhaps most likely to happen if it's an imbalance between you know, the load and the capacity. But again, injury is, is multifaceted. But they're coming to you and it really is up to you. I mean, they make the decision and that's the idea of patient-centered care, but they're looking to you as being the expert and your opinion it really greatly influences their decision. So there has to be... I think you're... Mm -hmm. No, you I disagree think? already. Already, really? straight off the bat. Mm -hmm. I think that patients will do whatever they are going to do. I don't think that's true at all. I think that you're able to give advice and education and that does influence their decision. If I, so you're saying that patients are always going to do what they're going to do and if someone's sitting in front of me and they have a navicular stress reaction and I say there's a possible chance that you'll fracture this and you may be out for six months, you mm. don't think that that influences their decision mm. at all? No, you're probably right. I think it's probably a mixture though. I yeah. think maybe less so in those really, really serious ones. Yeah. If it's, if it's a little bit in the gray, I think that there's going to be more decision-making on their part than your part. And maybe it, and maybe it becomes, comes down to the archetype of the person that, yeah. that influences that, whether they're more of a sort of endurance coper or a fear avoider. That might influence whether they are going to just do what they want to do or whether they're going to you know, pull back because yeah. that might be better for their body and injury. Yeah, I mean, the, the communi you're right, the communication... And we've got there, you know, the, the basic first principles 
are pretty simple. You just have to communicate what you think is best and I guess what you would advise. But as you said, and it happens all the time where people will make their own decisions regardless of your device, which is completely fine. Mm. And we were talking about this recently where if it come to you and you had a big race you've been training for for six months, I think we were talking about that a couple of weeks ago. If you've been training for a really long time, there's this event that you love or your friends are going, you've invested lots of time and, and money you know, there's certainly plenty of reasons why that why people want to do it. So mm. you can really just give your advice and and go from there. Yeah, I yeah. agree. I yeah. agree. In in on that note, though, as Blake said, the seriousness of the pathology does definitely need to be strongly communicated with the mm. the person. So, for example, uh, a soft tissue injury such as ITB pain, medial tibial stress syndrome, patellofemoral pain. I don't know if that's considered bone, uh, soft tissue or bony, but they, yeah. there's probably a little bit more wiggle room to, to get them through the run. Something that's more bony, like a stress reaction or a stress fracture, really yeah. needs to be considered about if it's worth it or not. Um, we This is a case we discussed, I think, in the last podcast, you know, the difference between a high-risk bone injury site site or a low risk bone injury site i think regardless as a clinician you probably need to be advising against racing however that's where it comes down to some people are just going to decide to do it and some people will probably take your opinion a little bit more on board yeah and and i know this person listens to the podcast but i had someone reach out to me when i did the webinar for for learning physiotherapy on bone stress injuries, tendons and OCD lesions at the tailor. So we actually jumped on Zoom this week and talked about a couple of BSI cases. And this person was saying that they'd listened to our podcast and our discussion and they could see both sides Mm. and try not to be too biased, but they did more so agree a little bit with me in the sense of if you're able to communicate the seriousness of what's happening and they still say, I'm going to do it anyway, Mm where do you draw the line of how much you're going to help and yeah. i'm probably of the nature where maybe i can understand that and i think you would too mm. you understand well if you're going to do it let's try and do everything we possibly can to lower that risk yeah knowing that we're never going to be able to mitigate it completely yeah yeah what do you i think? i agree maybe less so when it's a high risk bone injury site yeah it's a really i mean it's oh, such a hard question. It's it a is. really hard topic because you want to help. And, and it the- probably depends on so many different things as well. So yes, the the risk of the bone injury would come into it, but mm. also the individual, their past medical history, what other things they might have going on, the importance of the race. like, And that's what we're going to go through mm. today as well. But I think it's really hard to, to say what you would do because it's just going to vary so much depending on the situation. Yeah. Do you, do you ever think, I know it's a hypothetical, do you ever think that you would refuse to treat someone? So if I they... don't know if I could treat someone anyway, though. Like if someone had an avicular stress fracture yeah. or stress reaction and they wanted to do a race, I don't know what I can offer them. You know, just you just give as much advice as possible of, I don't know, cadence, stiff shoes, taping, mm. that kind of thing. Like would you... And I know it's hypothetical. What what do you think you would do? I don't I don't think I've ever had a, a true serious like this is really a very high risk of something going wrong. And it, yeah, just I don't know. I don't know what happens there. And then if, what happens with the legality of that? Like if you treat and it happens, I mean, if, as long as you document it, I guess. But I mean, I think. guess if you're dealing with a bone stress injury, you're gonna uh, assume that you've got a sports doctor in the mix as well so if it was quite tricky and I was really struggling with that decision Mm. making I would probably just handball it to the sports doctor to have that conversation with them because I think they they, (laughs) there is a hierarchy I do think and I think they're able to make the risks more clear Mm. almost they probably listen to them a bit more yeah yeah if that's an option yeah so number one seriousness and you definitely all the stuff that we're talking about like past medical history, past injuries, I have found that I'll communicate that with the person as well. So if I say, I'm advising that you don't run this marathon in three weeks, 
these are the reasons why I'm saying this and, mm. I'll, and I'll explain that to them as clearly and as simple as possible rather than just saying, I advise you don't do it because the risks are high because yeah. I want them to have an understanding. I'm not saying this because I don't want you to run. Like I'm, I'm generally worried that you may actually For sure. do it yourself. Exactly. And if, you know, if you're dealing with a younger female that has a neck of femur stress reaction and they aren't getting their period and mm. they have said that they've, um, they, they seem to have like a low energy availability or maybe even that's been diagnosed. Is it worth risking them running on a neck of femur stress fracture, potentially having to have it pinned and plated or, yeah. and then that could ultimately change their running career. I don't yeah. know. That's not worth it to me at all. I know. It, it makes me think when you say that, like that, that is a genuine outcome. And we talk a lot about not wanting to, to scare people with like the worst case scenario, like if this doesn't heal, you might have to have surgery. But where do you draw the line? I guess that changes between each clinician. Where do you draw the line of how much information I think you have to tell them that. Yeah. Like they yeah. could be up for a hip replacement at a yeah. very young age. Like that could change their whole life. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And it could have just been don't do that run save it for next year or something like yeah. that yeah and that, we said this a couple of weeks ago no one ever gets upset if you are too cautious when you've got plenty of justification for why you are too cautious mm. like if they go out and let's say they do have the the femoral stress reaction and they go out and run it and it's fine that's great and even if that person said oh i don't know why you were so worried i was fine i it wouldn't, it'd be just like water off a duck's back. Be like, yep, that's really great. But I'd still, if the next person was to happen again the next day, I would still give the same advice. Mm. Yeah. Right, yeah. next one. So seriousness, number one, really yeah. important. And then talking about irritability and pain, which I guess it can be self-limiting. You're right. What's yeah, I dropped my pen. I didn't know when you needed a pen for the podcast. I write stuff down. I'm looking at a sometimes, blank, I'm looking at a blank <laughs> piece of paper. Sometimes we now. say stuff and we're like, we'll add that to the show notes. And I'm certain that we never add anything to the show notes. So I've started writing that down so that we can add it to the show notes. Yeah, yeah I'll have to show you how to do that. Yeah, but you, we don't ever do it, do yeah, we? Yeah, uh, yeah, we need to get into the show notes. So that's more. what I've got my pen for. <laughs> yeah, right, <fair laughs> well. right, so irritability, pain. This is the, the tricky one, the self-limiting one, really, because you are limited by pain. So let's say, as we move down, you've ruled out it's, it's low risk. It's like an Achilles tendinopathy, maybe it's heel pain, patellofemoral pain, ITB, you know, quad-related load pain. <laughs> it's a <laughs> thing. So, yeah, what do you got to say on this? I think this one really comes down to asking the patient whether they think they can get through it or not. So mm. if they've gone for, tried to go for a five-kilometer run and they had to stop and get their partner to get call, they had to call their partner to come and pick them up, but they're scheduled to do a half marathon or a marathon that weekend, I often put it back on them asking, you know, what what do you think? Do you think you'd be able to get through this right now given how mm. irritable your knee was yesterday? Yeah. And and they kind of come up with the answer themselves, I think, yeah. a lot of the time. And it does tie into, as we're going to talk about, the archetype of the person. Are and the think? timing of how far away the race yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. So the, as you were saying, there's many categories of the personality of people that we, we see every day, but if they're an endurance coper versus someone that, that is quite avoidant, you know, someone can have a five out of 10 pain for one side of the camp that can be like, this is great. This is awesome. I can run a hundred kilometers on this for other mm -hmm. people that can be like, I can't get out of bed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it is important, but I guess it is self-limiting because pain is so variable and irritability is, is so variable. Yeah. yeah. And again, um, in terms of timing, so if it's the week of the race, then that's going to be very different if it's two weeks before the race because if it's two weeks before the race, you might be able to mm -hmm. recommend taking some anti-inflammatories if that's suitable you might be able to come up with some symptom modifying strategies to mm -hmm. keep them running or to help them figure out a way to run that's less painful. So I think that depends on a lot of the other variables. However, yeah, I think I think that's something that you can be pretty confident to sort of ask the the patient about whether they think that they can get through it. Again, as Blake said, pending it's one of the the lower risk injury sites. Yeah. 
you can use that as well as a bit of evidence for them to have an understanding of you know how likely that they will be able to get through a race they have coming up so if someone and this is a a real example if somebody is planning to do the UTA 100 and they're not able to run seven kilometers on race week you know it's probably it's pretty unlikely that they're going to be able to run that hundred yeah obviously without any pain but if they're getting pain at seven kilometers if you've still got another 93 kilometers to go you know it, it's worth considering of maybe going to an event that's less like the 50 or the 22 or dismissing the event overall mm. yeah yeah yeah, it's, yeah and then also from that understanding the consequences of participating so how how okay are they or you with the the flare-up that might follow so if you've got a a race coming up Mm. soon after and this is more of a a b race or a training race is it worth pushing yourself through that event if you if it's likely that you might need to deload for a, a while after the event and again that comes down to asking the person because it depends on what their goal is and, and sort of what they want to be getting out of the event or what they're looking at the event as. Yeah, this fits into like race characteristics, goal of the race, Yeah. <clears throat> would you say? Yeah, probably. Yeah. So as you were saying, is it the A or B race? Is it a race they're doing with friends? Is it a race where they're trying to get a personal best? Or is it a race they just want to get it done for some other reason? Mm-hmm. Or do they just have a... A financial tying to the race. I've had plenty of people yeah. say, especially for the UTA race, where like, I've, I've paid my money, I'm going to do it. I can't get a refund. I don't want to do it next year. Yeah. I'm just going to do it. I don't care what happens. I can have all the time off in the world. It's like, mm-hmm. great. If the goal is to finish, at least that gives us a lot more wiggle room where if your knees start hurting, you're not trying to get a personal best. You can walk, you can use poles, or yeah, yeah you can kind of modify it yourself. So, goal of the race and underneath that i guess sits the race characteristics Mm. what kind of race uh, is this person participating in and what is the presentation in regard to their injury and pain so are they doing a trail event with lots of elevation and it's really far or are they doing a fast 5k 10k half marathon or a marathon Mm -hmm. yeah yeah Yeah. what can and mm. the other thing that i was going to throw into that as well jumping back a couple of steps when we were talking about you know is it a personal best or is it, do they just want to get through it that can change for a couple of reasons so if they if they really want to get a personal best then they need to be pretty capable of running fast for however long the the race is and if the irritability of the injury is so high that they're not going to be able to run the pb is it worth just participating or is it worth deloading for a little bit and and then signing up to a race later on because again it might mean you have to have a longer period of time off and it might mean more time sort of off you know good training blocks as well yeah Uh, a good example of I guess the race characteristic would be someone with load related knee pain whether it be ITB syndrome or patellofemoral pain and they have a 50k hilly race coming up Mm. that is going to be different compared to running a half marathon and maybe more manageable compared to there's lots of elevation and you've just got to communicate that's probably the reality and based off what we know about anatomy and biomechanics and, and forces you can tell someone that you know what is going to stir up this knee which you probably already know is doing lots of downhill running mm. and this race has 4,000 meters of elevation that is different compared to someone that wants to go out and run a quick five kilometer race and they have the same knee pain the same pathology mm-hmm. so that, that's important i think they can get a better understanding from that and probably make a, a bit easier of a decision mm-hmm. yeah and obviously time as well first 20 minutes versus a couple of hours yeah yeah yeah, yeah, I agree. So psychology and the archetype of the person in front of you. This yeah, is so always... this is all under the individual themselves. So the person sitting in front of you or the person that you might be if you're the runner listening. Yeah, yeah. What have you got to say on this? Well, you put this one down, so I'm interested to hear your thoughts on what you mean by that, the archetype of the person and the psychology. Yeah, so the the person and the archetype is, I guess, their mould, how they feel about themselves, what they're capable of. And we see, 
you'd have to see thousands of different types of, or maybe similar types, but a little bit different on either end. And the really easy example to think of is a very new runner that's doing their first 10 kilometer race versus a very experienced runner that's also doing the same 10 kilometer race with let's say the same condition and the same amount of pain. The person that's done lots of running generally knows their body a lot better, understands the race, understands what's required, and has probably seen multiple therapists and had this conversation many a time. I think they're a lot more better positioned to perhaps know what they're capable of versus another type of person who's very new and hasn't done the race before and maybe doesn't really know what's expected or what this, I guess, injury means to them. Mm-hmm. Like as an example, for someone like yourself, you've had, you've had, you didn't have the stress fracture or the stress reaction, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. You've had stress reactions, you've had MTSS, you've had some soft tissue stuff. If you get injured now, based off how you feel with your pain, you would be pretty well positioned to know if you can do a race, wouldn't you? I'd say so. Yeah. I, I wish I was thinking when we started recording this podcast, I wish I had have listened to a podcast like this prior to, you know, various races in the past when I had ITB pain and, mm. and knew how to sort of self manage it and make decisions around whether it's worth it or not. Yeah. So yeah. So, but now but now yeah, and, and also, you know, where we are working in this field, you know, every day. So I think that also helps. Yeah. So I guess that that somewhat fits into the archetype. So let's say you've got those two examples, the really experienced person and the really fresh person. I have found, and I don't know what this, why this is, but I tend to find it more in people that are trail runners. They tend to be, and maybe because they do these ridiculous 50, 100, 150k races, they tend to be more of the endurance coper style. But I guess all runners probably are where the limiting factor for them is sometimes it's not really pain it's like they have to push themselves until they actually physically can't go anymore like yep. their achilles doesn't rupture but it tears or they get a stress fracture and they physically can't do it anymore it's funny so that archetype <laughs> yeah is is really important and you kind of get a bit of an idea as you start to see more runners and more people what kind of person is sitting in front of you and Mm. sometimes how firm you need to be with like you're probably gonna run on this regardless but you really really shouldn't and just i guess how how direct you are with them but yeah the archetype Mm. definitely does matter you just made me think of um a runner that i was chatting to this morning on my long run who did uta 100 three weeks ago and I was asking him about it and he's like yeah it was awesome best race I've ever done best thing I've ever done man I've never had to dig so deep before and I was like wow like amazing that you're so positive and optimistic about that race considering how mentally challenging it was so yeah I think that really you know demonstrates the the different archetypes of of people that are out there and and how they perceive a challenge whether it be through injury or through you know um physical difficulties yeah and it it does it does play into your decision making and and education because at times not saying you you can't trust people but if you have someone that's sitting there telling you they've done hundreds of you know multiple endurance events have had lots of injuries in the past and they're telling you their knees like a two out of ten it's maybe probably likely to be worse than that and they're like yeah it's not too bad i'm i'm getting through there i've had that multiple times with bony injuries like yeah it's it's pretty sore like yeah i get pain at night i've actually i've got pain all the time but i can push through and manage and i just change my run and do this and i'm like wow you are just finding every way under the sun to be able to get through this which is completely understandable when you're doing what you love so that type of person yeah you just tend to be maybe a little bit more firm and really advocate the seriousness of what's happening have you had people like that i always find that really hard to comment on because Mm. i think i don't think i mean i guess rating your level of pain is subjective so so that that might be accurate i don't know if they're i don't think they're lying to you i just think that Mm. that's that's what they are that's how they perceive their their pain to be so yeah i guess it's probably another reason why you um, just going off the severity of pain is not always indicative of how much damage might be happening. Yeah, but yeah, I definitely should rephrase that. I didn't mean it in the way of someone 
lying to you, but taking into context yeah. what it may mean when they say, yeah, I've got... So if someone comes in and says with they've got some midfoot pain, they're like, yeah, mm-hmm. I've got a bit of pain all the day and I've got pain really at night and I've got pain really all the time, but it's fine, don't worry about it. It's yeah. manageable. Like that's the possibility of a stress reaction or bone injury. So I think what you're trying to say is mm-hmm. with particularly with runners or endurance athletes, any kind of painful problem that they come into the clinic with your radar always needs to be up for more sinister pathologies such as stress fractures regardless of the severity but really trying to pick apart the the description that they're laying out for you and the Mm -hmm. characteristics of that injury because even if they're sort of dumbing it down a little bit or is that the word that no, I'm listening? D- downplaying. Downplaying it. Downplaying. Dumbing it down. <laughs> downplaying the injury. Yeah. That doesn't mean that there's not a, a serious problem going on. Yeah, perfectly. That's exactly what I meant to say. Yeah. Yeah. So you you touch on this one. It's a really good one. The the impact on any future event and how much rest can they have after the event and i guess this again relates probably more to the low risk ones where Mm, i've got a good example for this one actually yeah this week actually Mm -hmm. i had a a runner who is training for the gold coast marathon Mm -hmm. and she increased her training load recently and has ended up with some itb pain and was running this weekend the half marathon and so i said to her i was like like okay so let's just see if you can get through the run here's some symptom modifying strategies and i spoke with her after the the run and she had done the half marathon plus an extra nine kilometers on top of that to get to 30 k's and mentioned that she couldn't bend her knee had to keep it really straight so in my head I'm sort of thinking like that's probably a little bit much considering this is more of a b race or training race and the bigger goal is the gold coast marathon in four weeks now so that's that's probably an example of of what to be sort of thinking about with those injuries and Mm. and hindsight's a a powerful thing but that's something that I probably should have been a little bit more clear on with this person knowing the archetype that they are of a of an endurance copa definitely um and just how keen they they are to sort of do whatever they they can yeah yeah that's that's a very it's a short period to the next race Mm -hmm. yeah and people typically do that if they've got a big marathon or they've got something up coming up in say 12 or 16 weeks or even three to six months they like to do a race or a couple of things in between Mm. and it can be tricky if things are feeling good and you're in a race and you're really enjoying like i might push a little bit harder but that comes back to you i guess on the education which you can only do so much where perhaps you you know, do the race and enjoy it and and have a good time, but maybe not push as hard as what you wanted to, Mm -hmm. knowing that probably the harder you go, the higher the risk of you then not being as well prepared for that race that you've trained the longest period for. For sure. Yeah, that's that's really, really tricky. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. You did did mention as well the the level of preparation that that somebody has had. Yeah, so... I guess what I mean by that is what sort of foundation are we are we building on? Is this a, a person that has a, a pretty solid training volume underneath their belt or is this someone that is quite sporadic with their, their training and, and maybe doesn't have a lot of consistency? I think someone who has a, again, if this isn't a, a high-risk injury, mm-hmm. if they have a bit more consistency under their belt then they they probably have a bit more wiggle room to sort of deload temporarily and then reload back towards the event or a bit more capacity for things to sort of get back on track again whereas someone that's a bit more sort of sporadic and they might not have that capacity for for running or or a really good strong foundation it Mm -hmm. might make things a bit trickier and that probably also comes down to what you were talking about before with the archetype of person. Like, is this someone who knows their body, has been training for years, yeah. or is it someone that is a little bit fresher and may not have that sort of resilience and, and robustness to mm. build on? Yeah. Like, you've been running for <clears throat> 10, 15 years. You know, can you sacrifice a couple of weeks yeah. just to take off for, you know, trying to, to be as well prepared? Yeah. 
and and probably that. on that note as well on the other side of things if if this is a a runner who just wanted to tick that marathon off their bucket list and never really wanted to run again and had put in the last six months of of running just to get through this marathon then yeah maybe we could say that's not a huge amount of preparation in the grand scheme of marathons but you're probably going to let them do it regardless Mm. because they just want to tick it off and get it done yeah yeah and it (laughs) yeah yeah you're right it's it is it's so many moving parts and it's yeah. not that everything has to fall into place it's just you've got to advocate it and think of these things and it's very hard to think of these things on the fly but i guess and if you're listening to this and you see lots of runners and you've been in the position that, that we're in quite a bit where you're talking to people coming in to a race and you're trying to advocate the serious and maybe the not mm-hmm. so serious conditions it does become a little bit easier and perhaps yeah. you you do get a little bit biased because you have these experiences where, yep, yeah, I've seen plenty of people race a marathon with an Achilles tendinopathy. Mm. I've seen plenty of people do it with... Oh, I, two people are popping into my mind when I'm saying this forefoot conditions. Like I've, I have seen people that have been able to run... Two people that did... One did UTA 50 this year and one did UTA 50 last year with just like an intermeditarsal bursa and it got really irritable around 10 to 15 kilometers and we talked about you know the what are the likely consequences of you running 50 kilometers with an intermeditarsal bursa <clears throat> did all the symptom stuff but probably going to be sore it, it's very unlikely but it still could happen but it's very unlikely to do any severe damage it's just going to be really painful and probably mm-hmm. for a couple of weeks after or a couple of days we're never able to try to predict that but I'm pretty confident you can do it. I would probably advise that you take a little bit easier and those kind of things. And they did the race and they were completely fine. Yeah. And now when I see them, I get a little bit biased because I'm like, I've seen plenty of four foot conditions and they do these incredible events and have no issues, but it still comes back to using this framework because everybody is different. Mm. I think this happens all the time because more often than not, people... Well, maybe not more often than not, but people get probably a little bit more anxious leading into events about injuries or or painful problems i think the logical first step for a lot of runners is to to rest so they may rest for a couple of weeks then try running again and things might get aggravated and then they might come in to see you and by that time that could have been a month that's gone past by that time their race might be just around the corner so often we have to be thinking about these things on the spot during that initial consult and and trying to make these tough dis- decisions because it's it's possible that that race is only you know a couple of weeks down the track and we need to be thinking about you know how can we just get them through it yeah i've seen so many that have the race either the week they've seen me yeah or in another couple of weeks yeah 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 and that leads us and i'm going to start this with an example of symptom modification which there's so many things that fit under this and this is probably where it's hard because you're in your position because you're managing you know managing feet and ankles and knees and hips but i think the further away you get from the body perhaps the less influence you can have of modifying the symptoms Mm -hmm. in the sense of you can use orthoses and shoes and compression and and tape and lots of different things in the foot which you can at the knee and the hip but perhaps not as effective but symptom modification an example of something i saw last year doing a 50 kilometer ultra event saw me a week and two days prior to the event with a just a four foot pathology i think it was an adventitial bursa under one of the metatarsal heads and they wanted an injection and we've done like we did some cutouts and deflection and things like that which really worked they wanted an injection went and got an injection i saw them after the race and the injection took away all their pain did the race with all their pain and had no pain when they saw me after it and then i they saw did the race with no pain no pain completely went away and then i saw them a couple i think maybe a month after where they just slowly been getting back to running and then had no issues since so that's awesome yeah i think the symptom modification is hard and you just got to communicate and talk with the, the person say the risk and the, the pros and go from there what are your thoughts on this so with orthotics and footwear mm. how far out from the race <laughs> do they need to be for you to be making changes yeah great such a good question i i find with orthotics that more often 
maybe not more often than not, the, the risk is higher that people won't like to run in them and they take a little bit longer to get used to compared to if you're just doing the walking. So if somebody is, and this is not a rule of thumb or any golden rule at all, but if they have a race either that weekend or in a week or two, I'm probably more likely to say for them not to race in it and just wear it everywhere else in just their normal daily life because mm-hmm. one, it's more likely to get irritable because it's something different and it can be pretty significant change if I'm trying to unload something. Like if I'm trying to wedge them laterally and unload their forefoot, their foot's not designed to function like that and it hasn't functioned that way for the last <clears throat> however long. So it's a pretty big change. So the risk yeah. again is higher of something going wrong. That's one consideration. Blisters? Blisters, yeah. So two, I'm not able to modify it probably as much as what I would like. So if I'm seeing someone on Monday and they're racing on Sunday, they're not going to have much time in it. Mm. And I'm not going to see them Monday and then see them Wednesday and then see them Friday like, oh, great, the arch was too high and let me lower it. Oh, the outside was too much, let me lower it. Yeah. It just, I don't have enough time to modify it. And they don't have enough time to spend in it. Mm-hmm. So, and this is a good example of someone I saw this week that's doing the Gold Coast marathon which is how far away i think it's four weeks or five weeks yeah five weeks so we discussed they had some lateral foot pain we discussed that this and it was really comfortable and really reduced their symptoms quite a bit we talked about you can run in it maybe not just see how you feel but otherwise i still want you to wear it everywhere else so they have a job when they're on their their feet quite a bit Mm -hmm. and you just think a little bit like a shoulder sling i've got you in it for this period of time and then for the race you're in your stiff shoes propelling shoes and it's probably pretty unlikely that you're going to wear yeah third consideration which is a little bit less is it's very unlikely you are going to fit and this is just purely for orthotics it's very unlikely you're going to fit an orthotic into a super shoe or a race shoe. Yeah. Yeah. So if I'm fitting... And what's it going to do in a race shoe? Yeah, exactly. So you're trying to put something in an alpha fly or a vapor fly. You're probably going to have to make it custom and pretty thin. And it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable and hard. And plus, then you've got to get it right. So it's very yeah. likely you're going to put it in and they're probably not going to like it. So you've got to see them again and modify mm. it and... It may feel good for five kilometers, but you don't know until they've run 25 and they get 25 kilometers into the race and they're yeah. like, I've got to get this thing out of my shoe. So I just, I don't do it that often. And yeah. I just do it all the other time. So it's like, if we can offload it 98% of the time and then for that 2% time you're out there running for 90 minutes, that turn you don't wear it and you've just got used to you've shoes. you just got to deal with it. One thing that might be useful during the race that... I don't think is going to have too much of an impact on other areas, particularly if we're talking about foot and ankle, Mm. Achilles, calf injuries, is heel lifts I think can work quite well. Oh, yeah, hell yeah. Because you just slip them in underneath the sole of their their shoe. It's not really shifting too much load around elsewhere, maybe a little bit higher up towards the knee, but I think it can have a pretty um, significant effect on symptoms around the foot and the ankle. So I think that's one that could be implemented in that sort of later stage towards the towards when the race is happening. Yeah, I felt like an insertion of Achilles yep. or yeah, heel, a game changer. compressive heel pain works really well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's hard. I mean, there's lots of things that you, that you can do. It's just, do you have the time to do them? Like mm. let's say someone with knee pain. Yes, the evidence says if they're in a lower drop shoe, it can probably make them Yeah, I think that's better. risky too. Do you then, yeah, the risk of then changing that is one. Two, do they go out and spend... $250 on a pair of ultras, which aren't going to be as poppy. They probably haven't raced and they haven't run in them for maybe a reduction of one pain mm. on the pain scale. Like, and as you said, you know, the impact of footwear reduces the further away from the foot and the ankle that we move. So if yeah. we're shifting someone into a lower drop shoe to impact their knee, the actual mm. overall effect that it's going to have is probably slim. Yeah. I would probably opt to go to other symptom modifiers such as Look at jumping, get like getting them to jump up onto a treadmill, filming their running, and giving them some cues to maybe yeah. help offload their knee symptoms in in other ways or hip symptoms or or anything else that's further up and yeah. and foot and ankle as well, I guess. Which is generally like cadence, yeah, step width, step width. yeah. 
and maybe foot strike pattern but again there's risks associated with doing this yeah and i guess those things it's not it's not something that you'd send them into the race saying you have to do this the entire run (laughs) it's something that if they're getting symptoms and they've found those strategies to be helpful in the days or the weeks leading into the race then they can take them on board and and try them just to get them through the race a little bit more comfortably so whether it's okay I'm going to start taking shorter quicker steps now or oh that's right I needed to take my step width a little bit wider they might remember that for a minute or two minutes and then they'll go back to their normal running and that's okay but they have that as a tool that they can use to sort of problem solve throughout the race which we'll talk about in a second yeah or they walk the downhills because their knees sore yeah if they were on a trail yeah yeah I wanted to talk about anti-inflammatories because I think that this is important. It's something that us as physios legally can't recommend. Mm. It's something that we can potentially suggest to patients and sort of back ourselves by saying, you know, just double check with your GP or the pharmacist that it's not going to be interacting with anything else that you may be taking. I would also be thinking about the timeline for recommending anti-inflammatories if you think that they might be useful. So if it's the week of the event, you probably don't want to be recommending them to take anti-inflammatories for a couple of reasons. Number one is that it thins your blood, I think. Anti-inflammatories thin your blood. So if something happens like you fall over, roll an ankle, anything like that, it's going to increase blood, like a lot of blood flow to that area. Um, The other thing that it's going to do is it can have an impact on your kidney function. So if it's a really hot race and you're quite dehydrated or you're not getting that hydration in properly, then it can have a pretty significant effect on you for that reason as well. So um, be careful about recommending anti-inflammatories. They they can have a really good effect maybe in the, a couple of weeks before the event, but in that week of the event, that's probably something to to stay away from or, or just let the doctor recommend it if, if they think it's something that could be useful. Yeah, and further to that, <clears throat> when you're talking about, I guess, uh, in you know, the external symptom modification, don't rule out the potential of injections and mm-hmm. in most cases almost all cases unless you've got your prescribing rights that decision is certainly not up to us and that's mm-hmm. on the sports doctor or the orthopedic surgeon to, to make that choice but that that can be a viable option for some people and there are certain conditions where it matters more than most like as an example i was saying before four foot conditions or perhaps maybe ITB or even with shin related pain like there are people who will benefit from them and there's lots of things that have to go into that decision like the timeline if they've had them before those kind of things but yeah if if someone suggests that I'm not saying say that's an option go and see them or don't say no no don't even think about it just maybe say yeah that could be an option and depending on how well you can go with your other things you would go and see someone else for that Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah yeah and then other symptom modifiers is taping um stretching isometrics like whatever feels good for that person that they've tried and they say that gives me relief just do heaps of it there's yeah. no there's no right or wrong for for those sorts of things i think if it's the person knows that best and you can just encourage them to do more of that if that's going to help them you know get through their run yeah B and B the person to tell them that it's probably likely they're going to have some pain and discomfort, would you say that it's worthwhile to give them a bit like a traffic light system? Like, is it worth saying this is when you should stop, this is when you should probably walk, or this is where you're right to keep going? Because Mm. with these injuries, it's it's almost guaranteed they're going to have some pain and discomfort. Mm. And I don't know... Do you think it's viable to say, you know, if it's low and stable or if it gets to a point where you can manage it, that's great. But Mm -hmm. once it gets more than that, it's perhaps best to think about maybe walking or perhaps pulling out. What do you think? That's exactly what I said to to the um, patient that I had this week who was racing this weekend for Mm -hmm. that um, that half marathon. I said, look, let's let's keep your symptoms less than like a three or a four out of ten. If it gets to the point where you're thinking about it all the time or your gait is changing, then I just don't think it's going to be worth it given that your big goal is the marathon in four weeks yeah um yeah 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 great should we end it there or you wanted to talk about after the event 
I think let's keep going and get through this. Do you not think so? Yeah, yeah, I guess. Because so. that's so everything that Blake and I just spoke about was was pre-event. Mm. These ones won't take very long. It's we've just got some quick things to go down. Yeah, yeah, you lead it, you lead it. Um, so then during the event, we've we've pretty much touched on this mostly, but the main things that you're sort of thinking about is symptom modification and troubleshooting in real time, really. So the mm. the different running cues is something that you've probably gone through with the patient in the the weeks or days prior to the event and so that might be getting them to think about their cadence or whatever running cue you think might be relevant to the painful problem that they're experiencing and like we said just educating them to to troubleshoot that themselves as they're they're running Mm. um symptom other symptom modifications might be you know for an achilles doing a couple of isometrics before the run just giving it that opportunity to to warm up maybe popping those heel lifts into their shoes and and having some decision making around the footwear that they actually wear for the event whether it's got a stiff carbon plate in it or whether they might actually be better off with something a bit more spongy just depending on what they feel is best for them yeah, yeah, lower drop, high drop yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. You can think simply with shoes that they <clears throat> offload in the sagittal plane, which is the forward and backwards, which you guys know, like dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. Mm-hmm. Or you can think of shoes helping in the frontal plane, which is the rolling in and rolling out. So mm-hmm. someone with an Achilles, they're going to benefit from a shoe that has more of an effect in the sagittal plane. Someone with tibialis, tibialis posterior pain, they're probably going to benefit from someone that's, sorry, something of a shoe that has more control on the frontal plane. Yeah. 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 If you do struggle with footwear, that's a pretty easy way to, to, think, to think about, about it. it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's good. Cool. Anything else you want to add to the during event? That's pretty um, straightforward, really. It's kind of just grin and bear it, isn't it? Yeah. Maybe run, run with a bit of cortisone in the back of your jumper so you can just quickly Just inject jump. it. Yeah. Bit of cramp fix as well. Yeah, cramp fix is good. Just bang straight on the ITB. Five mils of cortisone plus a bit of local in there. <laughs> Yeah, a local, up, yeah, a bit of local wouldn't be too bad. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, wish yeah. I had that when during that half marathon that I did with my ITB. Man, that was painful. Yeah. I and you know what else I wish? Yeah. I wish I knew that a wider gate could have helped. I reckon that would have just helped. It would have hey? helped. Yeah. I yeah. do. Could have been an OG climb. Could have been. Right. So after the event, you've got here deload. Wait, wait. Halt there. Hmm. Bring the energy up. You've just gone real flat. Well, we're talking about pre- you're just like rushing through it. Like, right, let's get this done. Yeah. Well, I wanted to. I wanted it to be. It's our podcast. Mm. I understand, but I, I thought we'd agreed to have it pre. Like this is pre-race. Yeah, but then also during and after is just this is quick stuff. Yeah. All get right. Through it. Yeah. Okay. Right. I'll just talk because I'm more energetic than you are. Yeah. Clearly. Yeah. Clearly. Because I had such a good run this morning. Yeah. After the event, the main things that you're thinking about is deload and then reload, Mm. I would say. So if you've got an injury going into an event, you have to prioritize deloading after. You need to give your physiology time to, to catch up. Now, that doesn't need to mean complete rest. It can mean active recovery. It can mean cross training or it could mean very easy running and again just building up that that foundation eliminating any speed work and and seeing if we can get those symptoms to to calm down and settle again that's probably the main things um and getting into the gym so i would really be looking at this as an opportunity to build capacity in that relevant area make it really purposeful and progressive and and Maybe, yeah, even if you can get yourself into a, a good physio that can give you some or assess any deficits that you might be experiencing and come up with a really good rehab plan for you because I think that that's going to help quite a lot. Yeah, have a plan for after the race, Yeah, definitely. I like to do <clears> – <throat> I like to put the review a week or two after the race and just say whatever you feel comfortable doing. You know, if it's really sore, just have a week off <clears throat> from running. But if you're able to do it, just go out for some more s- small and slow runs and just see how things feel. And mm. we'll see you in a week or two. Yeah, yeah. I don't like to book it a day or two after yeah. and, and go from there. And, you know, if you're a clinician, I think it, there's value in, and I think, well, I have found that the patients definitely value it. And maybe because we're 
quite invested, just see how they went, send them an email, perhaps mm-hmm. send them a message through your booking, like Clinico or Nuco, and just say, hey, how was the race? How did you go? How did it feel? And if they say, it was manageable, good, that's a good sign. If they say, no, I've got this really severe pain now, I'm limping, I can't walk, mm-hmm. you probably need to maybe give them a call and talk about what's next. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, that didn't take too long. No, it was good. Glad we went through that. Yeah. Good, let's, let's end it there. That was a fun episode. I think that you guys will hopefully get a lot out of that, whether you're a clinician or a runner. Let us know what you think and if you do anything differently. This isn't really, hasn't been based off any like research or studies. This is just our experience and what we would 